This episode is brought to you by Imagine Strength, your go-to for safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. Growing a successful high-intensity training business requires workout equipment that's not only high quality, but also intelligently designed to fit the unique needs of your studio. And that's where Imagine Strength comes in. Drawing on the wisdom of the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength has crafted a groundbreaking line of fitness equipment that's as affordable as it is efficient, giving your studio the upgrade it needs without breaking the bank. The team at Imagine Strength breathes hit. Their passion for high intensity training shines through in their designs, which they've consistently refined and innovated for optimum effectiveness and user experience. From my personal experience at REC, I can attest to the careful consideration and craftsmanship that goes into every single piece. My Imagine Strength workout was absolutely brutal, in a good way, of course. Now, what makes Imagine Strength truly stand out? They have innovative equipment tailored for the unique needs of HIT studios, affordable and efficient designs, lowering the barriers to entry for a HIT business, continuous innovation and refinement, ensuring your studio stays ahead of the curve. Founder Jeff Turner and his team are dedicated to moving the HIT industry forward and making strength training accessible to more people than ever before. Here's how you get started. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, discuss your specific needs with the team. And number three, select the equipment that will propel your business to the next level. Head to imaginestrength.com today and give your HIT business the Imagine Strength edge. Be part of the HIT revolution and see firsthand how their unique equipment can transform your studio's workout experience. Elevate your HIT business with Imagine Strength. Hey, it's Lawrence here. Welcome back to High Intensity Business, your one-stop shop for elevating your HIT business and fueling your passion for high intensity training. Before we dive into today's episode, grab your free PDF guide on how to turn your HIT business into a robust referral generating machine. You can download that now over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref, the short for referrals. You'll also get a full length video training with CEO of Discover Strength, Luke Carlson, on how to build a referral machine. And you get access to lots of free resources, including HIT business guides, checklists, and so much more. Go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref, that's short for referral, R-E-F. This is episode 424, and it's called, or it's about, how to train endurance athletes with Dr. James Fisher. Dr. Fisher is a respected senior lecturer and senior research fellow for sports conditioning and fitness, and he holds a PhD in sport and exercise science from the University of Bath, and is an associate professor of sports and conditioning and fitness at Southampton Sony University in the UK. James is one of the foremost experts on the subject of resistance training. So regarding this episode, this is a throwback membership only podcast from December 2021. Now you can join the membership and get playbooks and coaching to grow your hit business by going to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash join. If you're struggling to design optimal strength training programs for endurance based clients, or you're looking to optimize your own program to support your endurance activity, you will love this episode. What makes this podcast really unique and valuable is that James is an endurance athlete himself, and so he brings a participant's perspective through a scientific lens. James goes into detail on how you construct the consultation before you even think about training the client or doing the programming. We get into the key benefits of resistance training as it relates to helping endurance athletes and how you should program the training in terms of exercise selection, frequency, and volume, and much, much more. So, Without any further ado, please enjoy the episode. So welcome everyone to the December 2021 membership content. Thank you for joining and watching this or listening to this. And uh, we do this every single month. We, we pick a topic that's normally either business focused or personal training, and we tend to alternate between the two um, each month. And we've had previously, we've had Dr. Doug McGuff, John Little, uh, Luke Carlson, Jeff Tomasuski, Bill De Simone, all the the best minds that I can think of in terms of helping you grow your strength training studio, but also uh, improve the personal training operation uh, and the, 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 all the nuances around how you train clients and exercise and all of that as well. Um, and today we have one of those people. We have James Fisher, PhD, course leader and senior lecturer for the School of Sport and Health and Social Sciences at Southampton Sony University in the UK. He specializes across both exercise physiology, biomechanics and resistance training. James is an active researcher, publishing numerous peer-reviewed studies relating to health and fitness. And um, I think the reason I think James is a great fit for this particular membership podcast 
which is focused on how to train endurance athletes, is that James, despite his you know, broad shoulders and muscular physique, um, is an endurance athlete. <laughs> And, and, you know, he reminded me in the membership that as a cyclist, he's completed, competed, sorry, at the world Chan championship in 2018 in, is that Varese? Varese, how you say that yeah, in Italy? I call mine said Varese. I'm, I'm Varese. Italian, terrible, so yeah. Yeah, Varese, yeah. And yearly does a hundred mile events in the region of four hours and four hours, 30 minutes, depending on climbs. And he said, I'm afraid the lower body resistance training needs to be reduced. Full stop, considerably full stop. <laughs> Um, and you said that you felt that the reality is that high intensity training, um, may be a bit too dogmatic and generic in prescription and might need more of a personal approach for sports people and events, which I thought was a great, really interesting point. And obviously we had some back and forth in the membership and in the happy hour, you know, as it relates to training endurance athletes. And you know, we have someone in our studio who's really keen, uh, endurance cyclists. So I was really keen to learn from you and and Luke and the others in terms of, you know, how we can best serve this particular client. So I thought we would kind of go through this in a logical fashion, like as in start with, if I'm having an initial consultation with this client, what kinds of things I should ask. Now, I think you're good for this because obviously you understand what one should ask as a personal trainer, because you've been a trainer and you've done all the research and stuff, but also as a client, what you would like to be asked, right? Because you've got those kinds of specific needs. So starting there, um, having initial in the initial consultation, what types of questions do you think are absolutely paramount for endurance athletes and understanding their specific needs? Yeah. Okay. Well, so first of all, I just want to say thank you for for setting this up because I think it's a really important area to revisit, and I and I definitely think that one of the criticisms that that holds true of some of some, not all, but some high intensity training practitioners is they follow the same workout for the same people very systematically without variation. And whilst that can be very efficacious as far as strength increases and health benefits, it, it, it starts to lose personal training. It starts to stop being personal training. And, and a one size fits all approach is, is certainly a criticism of, of HIT. Um, I think that it's a great point to the client walks in the door. What do we first want to know? What's our initial client consultation look like? And I, I kind of pitch this in a slightly different way. I, I always say to the client, what, what's, let, let's do a needs analysis. So we can approach this from the point of view of uh, an endurance athlete, but it might be the same for an endurance, um, an endurance sport. So let's say soccer. Um, or football. So I, I would call that an endurance sport, that the, the athlete is on the field for 90 minutes. It's certainly more important that they have aerobic um, endurance than they have necessarily muscular strength. So how do you pitch resistance training? And historically, this stuff, one of those sports where they haven't undertaken a lot of resistance training because they said, no, it'll make them slow, it'll make them heavy, it'll make them bulky, they'll lose flexibility and so forth. So I think that we can shape this around endurance athletes, maybe runners, cyclists, triathletes, so forth. But I think that we can look at a broader picture across a number of athletes and a number of the sports. Perfect. And, and, and the first thing that I would say is our, our consultation slash needs analysis. What is, who is our athlete? What's their history of the sport they've done? So how long have they been doing the sport? Maybe how serious do they take it? What, uh, what element of the sport do they do? So we can say a triathlete. But there's a big difference between an Ironman triathlete and a super sprint triathlete. So they're, they're by far and away different needs. If we say a football player, there's a big difference between a, a center back and a midfielder. Okay. So I think any kind of needs analysis has to look at what are the specific requirements of their sport? Um, how do they currently train for their sport and how have they historically trained for it? Because it might be that they can give us some insight into their kind of previous best performances and whether they're at their best looking to improve or whether they've had their best and they're trying to hang on to every bit they can, or they're trying to get back from injury or pregnancy or whatever it might be. Um, so I think that anything like that can be really important. And that can also tell us probably the most important question, which is where do they want to go? So if you're working with a 17-year-old football player, they might have ambitions to go to the Premier League. 
well, that's going to be completely different from a 45, 50 year old triathlete who's looking to just not get injured and maybe improve their time by a few minutes and get a PV or something like that. So I think that knowing where they're trying to get to is, is, is really, really important. And we, we as a trainer want to know, or I would say you as a trainer would want to know all of those things about your client, where have they been, where are they going? And, and then it might be that if we break down elements of their, of their performance, where are their strengths or where are their weaknesses? So if you take a triathlete, for example, they might be as systematic as I'm great at the swim. I'm poor on the bike or I'm poor on the run, or I get cramped on the run or I, whatever X, Y, Z it might be, you know, where, where their strengths lie, which is something maybe we don't need to think about or where their weaknesses lie. They're prone to picking up injuries, da, 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 whatever it might be. And I think that's key, a key sort of part of any kind of, um, needs analysis or initial consultation. I think around that, we want to know what but what's their current training diary like? So typically endurance athletes have done huge amounts of training to the extent where probably most have been overtraining. Um, more so over the last 10, maybe 20 years, the, the trend has been to vary that training between long sort of slow or long steady state events, maybe long runs, long rides, long swims. And then interval sessions or short, high effort sessions, you know, 20, 30 minutes on a bike or a run or so, um, for me as a cyclist and previously as a triathlete, um, you know, it wasn't always about being able to go and spend hours and hours on the bike or hours and hours in the pool. There were times that I would go out and swim, you know, but one and a half kilometers, but there was also times that all I could fit in was maybe, um. 20 minutes in the pool. And so the most important thing for me was to do say hundred meter repeats. So I would do hundred meters, but as I can 30 seconds rest or rest up to the end of the next minute, repeat, do the same again. So you're kind of in that anaerobic, uh, threshold and creating that, um, that oxygen debt, um, rather than just doing out and, and plodding on a long run, long swim, long bike ride. Uh, and I think knowing how they currently have that set up is really, really important. The other thing around that, that, that is a big factor, especially for cyclists, maybe not so much for runners, but it's who they train with. So for example, a, a, a cy cyclists are typically part of a, a cycle club. Um, and the kind of the etiquette in cycling is that you don't want to be the guy that slows down the club. If you go out with 10, 10 club mates cycling. And you did a leg workout the day before, so you're, you know, dying the first hour and you've got another two or three hours to go, then you're ruining everybody else's ride. Yeah. And you're slowing it down in the wind. So you're making everybody else cold because they're now not having to work as hard or, or so. So there's kind of an etiquette around that that needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, otherwise you just kind of lose the client. You know, if you said to me, oh, we're going to do a workout on day one. And I know that my club ride is day two. I'm probably going to lose day one workout for the sake of the cycling. Uh, That's so key. Yeah. So I think that we need to, we need to know who they train with and maybe, maybe even what those other people do. Do those other people do strength training? Do they do longer rides? Do they do shorter rides? Do, can you change around what they do in a week? And then, and then of course, around all of that, there's your little lifestyle habits that they have, which might impact their nutrition, which might impact their sleep, which might impact their stress, which would certainly impact time that they have to commit to strength training and, and so forth, you know, uh, lifestyle factors, family, children, so forth. So, and I think gathering that information creates picture of our athlete that gives us uh, all the facets that we want to know, all the information that we want to have, um, to be able to now create an image of what their training could look like, does look like, mm -hmm. uh, how it might be optimized, where they might be missing opportunities, uh, or where they're currently doing too much or what they might be able to give up or so forth. So I think there's a lot to gather there and it's certainly a big ask. It's certainly a lot more than somebody else walking in the door, 
but it's, I think there's a lot there to, to take in. And, and I think most athletes would expect a lot of issues, but a lot of unanswered questions, um, to know that their other training, their other competition is being taken seriously and is the center point, you know, I think just to wrap that up, I think the summary is if somebody walks in the door and they're a triathlete, they're looking to improve performance at triathlon. They're probably not looking to quit triathlon and take up strength training. So strength training is the, is the added. And if it's been an added, it, it, it can be taken out just as quick if it doesn't fit for them. So it's how we, and I can add strength training in the right way to, to improve or help them. Yeah. Well said. And I think just to help help wrap this up a bit more as well i think you know i i'm thinking of studios out there our, our own studio other strength training studios who focus on the busy professional the busy executive as their primary target market now the reality is is in my mind if you're going to have the conversation that encapsulates everything you just said that's an hour at least at least right if you really want to get detailed and understand them really intimately and that just might not fit your business model. And that's okay because you weren't built for that individual. But there might be other members or other strength trainer businesses out there who do want to specialize in this, this particular niche and training athletes. And uh, obviously there's, there's some reasons why a lot of our colleagues don't because typically they, they're not as... Uh, enamored by the high intensity training, training approach because they want to train more frequently. Uh, I suppose that's not always true, actually. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I just want to say that I think, I think occasionally, you know, it's important to think, well, if my target market is the busy professional, then don't necessarily increase your consultation to, to factor in this person's needs because that's not who you're built for. So. I'm not, I mean, obviously there will be, there will be athletes who come into the studio who want a consultation. And I just think that maybe it has to be a little bit shorter. And if they decide to join, that's fine. You know, I, I don't know if that makes sense, James. I'm just trying to bridge yeah, it out Yeah, absolutely. There. Absolutely. And, and, and the thing that's really sad about that is that I think high intensity yeah. training fits perfectly for most athletes because, especially yeah. German athletes, because of the time limitations. So it might be that they forego that the, the, the trainer or business owner forgoes some time in the initial with a client or with a group of clients to, to, you know, even to work with, let's say a triathlon club to, to create a training program for them and have them come in and maybe do small group sessions or so forth. If they're, if they're looking to move into that kind of market or if they have a single client, maybe they can, maybe there's a small way to do that. I don't have the answers in that because I'm not a business man and I don't run, run a personal training business, but I think there are probably some small ways around that. It might be that they also develop a pro forma that they simply send to the athlete and then the athlete to give as much information as they can on a document and then, and then they make the time to go through it, which would certainly be a lot more time efficient than doing an interview. But it might also mean that some information is missed if the athlete is kind of filling it in on paper to say, you know, via email or whatever. Yeah, no, that's a good good point. It, um, it might be that the biggest point here is to get in a cell with the athlete initially. Um, and I would say the key things are, are what are the benefits for the athlete. So why is, why is an endurance athlete first walking through a studio door or, or first contemplating strength training? Well, <laughs> strength training is shown to improve flexibility and range of motion around a joint. And, and most athletes, swimmers, triathletes, runners, football players, would never say that flexibility is not important to them. They would always say flexibility is going to be a key part of what they, what they need, or it would be at least beneficial to them. Certainly having more flexibility is never a disadvantage in a, in a sport. Like that. So improve, improve flexibility is there. Like obviously improved strength is going to be a key part of that, but, but with improved strength typically comes injury prevention. So our football players or swimmers, triathletes, uh, they're so, especially in female. Um, athletes who have a slightly different cue angle, which is the width of their hip to the, to the angle of their knee. So the angle of their femur, so the inwards, um, you know, strengthen their quadriceps is shown to reduce the cue angle, which is slightly turning the knee outwards and it and reduces the risk of kind of ACL injury and so forth, which is not necessarily just for football, oh. but for runners and things like that as well. So injury prevention is huge. You know, we don't need to get into the details of how, 
Um, of course, we talk about bone mineral density and strength training. So strength training is going to improve bone mineral density, which in turn is going to reduce risk of injury and fracture and things like that. She's also going to reduce our risk of, of stress fracture and overtraining injury, which is common in cyclists. I've known uh, GB rowers who get stress fractures in their ribs from overtraining because their bodies are simply so broken down by the amount they're doing. And um, so we certainly want to load the skeletal system. And um, we can look at things like uh, tendon stiffness, which is great for uh, for our economy as well. So uh, our running economy, our cycling economy, and so forth. And that's going to be the next area where, where we see improvements. How does that work? Why is there improved economy? When you, when you... So improved economy simply means that if you, if I went out and ran a 5K today and I did a 20 minute 5K and I had an average heart rate of 160 beats per minute, and in 10 weeks time, I went out around a 5K in 18 minutes, but I was at 160 beats per minute. So I've got the same physical stress, but I've got an improved time. So arguably I could then run that 20 minute 5K at say 155 beats per minute. So that's improved the economy. My body's able to move that oxygen around my system um, more efficiently and have the oxygen transfer in my muscles more efficiently. And, and the carbon dioxide evacuation more efficiently. So my body simply isn't having to work as hard. Well, most athletes would take that, you know, if they, if you, if they say, you know, I can just about do a four hour marathon. And I said, well, how about with strength training, you, you can far more comfortably do a four hour marathon, or if you want to work just as hard, if you want a three sport to your 345 or whatever it might be. Um, you know, so most athletes would probably take that improved economy. And um, certainly as we get older, because what we tend to see is a drop off in performance rather than a, a sustained performance. So is that, is that, but how does that then relate to tendons and strength? Is that just because you mentioned it in relation to tendons? That's what I was curious about. Yeah. So we see much good. So, so our tendon stiffness gives us more recoil. So, so typically it's in runners that we see that we want to see our tendon stiffness and, and that's going to give us, and, and most people think tendon stiffness, oh, well, that's the opposite of flexibility. It's not. Flexibility is our ability from muscle to lengthen. Tendon stiffness is our ability for a muscle to produce fall or to, re, or to return force from impact. So if we imagine a heel strike, when our heel lands, our Achilles tendon compresses, and then we'll recoil outwards. So as a basketball player, you know, as we land on the floor, we want that, that spring back outwards again. So our tendon stiffness is going to give us that spring back outwards. And then our, our force through our, through our gastrolegus and our soleus, through our calf muscles, as well as our quadriceps, hamstring, glutes, is going to give us that upward propulsion. So that tendon stiffness is going to give us, you know, if we imagine that in a feeling stride after stride after stride of running, that improves our economy because I now don't have to produce as much force because my tendons are giving me more spring back. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Yeah. Thank you. That was much, much more uh, easy to understand. There are some great examples actually to talk about long tendons and tendon stiffness and recall. And there was, uh, there's a, a two famous hydrables called Stefan Holm and Donald Thomas. And, and Donald Thomas was a, I want to say Jamaican, he might be Trinidad, uh, hydrogel with very, very long tendons. And to get the, the biomechanics use the example that to get the recoil out of his tendon, he lands, has a very, very long impact time to allow his tendons to compress and that recoil to jump back over the, the hydro bar. Whereas Stefan Holm, big, big gastrocnemius muscle, short tendon, lands down and gets a very, very short spring because his tendon doesn't allow as much compression and then recoil. So, uh, so the, you know, as, as we get into, you know, this is going to some of the lectures that I give now, but from a biomechanical purpose, there's definitely an advantage to sort of tendon stiffness. Cool. Awesome. And, um, that was, yeah, that was great. Like some of those benefits I haven't, I, I wasn't aware of or didn't, and I haven't directly said to my client, obviously I've mentioned injury prevention, bone mineral density, strength. But are there any, any other things that come to mind in terms of benefits? Because this is really good ammunition for selling this type of client. Um, those would be the key benefits that you sell on an, to an endurance athlete. I mean, near you where the benefits are, uh, you know, sort of physiological changes and obviously your health benefits, your glucose sensitivity um, and things like that, which might help, body, which might aid in body composition. 
typically endurance athletes take on huge amounts of sugar. You know, uh, I, I used to joke with people that, that your athletes like Steve Redgrave, Redgrave and James Cracknell, who were, you know, phenomenal athletes, um, who, who arguably, you know, used to say that they consumed thousands and thousands and thousands of calories. Say, I think, I think I read somewhere that at one point Steve Redgrave was, was consuming 10,000 kilocalories a day and a huge high carbohydrate, uh, you know, diet. And I used to say, you know, his body can't handle that. He's a short, he's a short thing for diabetes. There's no, you know, you can't, you can't combat that. So I think that, um, emptying those, those glucose reserves and creating that glucose sensitivity, especially because it, you know, a lot of endurance athletes, a lot of cyclists will fall into the trap of fueling, 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 even when they don't necessarily need it. Uh, cyclists are great for taking on energy gels. And I've known, I've known guys that I got riding with and 10 miles into the ride, they're taking an energy gel and I, and I'm. For me, I think that's crazy. They've not even used the, the sugar that's in their body, in their muscles yet. They don't need to start to replenish anything. Now, in their mind, they're probably replenishing before they, before they lose it. So, um, you know, they're keeping themselves topped up, as it were. But I, I tend to have a different mindset on that kind of thing. So, um, and, and surely with that sugar intake, you know, there's a need, there's a benefit to, you know, resistance training and maintaining good, good glucose metabolism so you know it's this makes me think of this particular client we have who is a you know keen cyclist and you know he's always kind of trying to figure out how he can get an edge and interestingly lately he's he's been going through he's had a lot of stress in his personal life which has made him kind of go okay i can i can park you know personal bests for a while but before that he was keen to find out what, how he could get an edge. And, you know, he, as far as a, a elite cyclist go, his body fat was too high. Like, you know, compared to the average person, he looked well, but he could probably lose, I'm trying to remember what his kind of body fat percentage was now, but he could probably lose like five to 10%, uh, uh, you know? And I said, oh. you know what? That's going to be probably like the, the, the most high leverage thing you can do because the leaner you are, the less stress you're putting on your joints, the less weight you're moving through the ride, up hills, yeah. et cetera, you're going to improve your economy. Um, you're going to be healthier anyway. So would, would you agree with that? Is that's probably one of the most important things like an athlete can do is get, get lean in, in yeah. this context. Yeah, certainly for cyclists. Excuse me, certainly for cyclists, uh, body weight is going to be a key factor. It's really, I mean, it's really interesting. The, big, the bigger picture of all of this is cyclists typically will spend you know, yeah. quite a large sum of money to save 30 grams on a pair of pedals or 20 grams on a new stem or a seat or whatever it might a be. A ton of money, a ton of money. Let alone the amount of money, the thousands of pounds you can spend on wheels or bike frames and so forth. You know, you can get a bike down to, to I mean, the UCI limit is 0.1 kilos. Um, you can get a bike down to that weight. But the difference between a seven and a six kilo bike can be thousands of pounds. The difference between weighing 72 and 71 kilos is not drastic. I mean, dropping a kilo of body weight is not a huge thing. So, you know, it, it's really interesting. Most people, when they get, you know, certainly for me, as I get towards a big event, one of the things that I definitely start to do in the months in the run up is, is to bring my body weight back into control. And I have kind of an ideal, what I call my fighting weight. But I don't, what I don't do is in the months in the run up to it, think, right, I need to spend, you know, another 3,000 pounds on a lighter wheels and a lighter seat and a lighter handlebars. You know, I, I just get my weight under control. So you're actually right with that. The, 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 the funny thing about all of that is this is where cyclists often look at strength training and go, whoa, 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 I don't, I don't want to add muscle. I don't want to add muscle. Um, and they're actually right. They don't want to add, they want to add muscle bulk. They don't want to add bigger biceps. You know, I've, you know, it, it, in all seriousness, been on, been on cycles up, up you know, volcanoes up mountains. I had cyclists kind of point at me and kind of touch my biceps and go, you know, then they're good for you on a bike. Um, and, and, and I laugh about it and go, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of that. But I, always, I also know that, you know, I'm not going to give up my resistance training, so I don't care. Or your biceps. <laughs> if that's what slows me down on a bike, I'd rather have that moment where somebody points at my biceps. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe that's how I got into cycling because they typically don't have good biceps. Yeah. <laughs> my seriously mediocre biceps stand out in that. But, that is but hilarious. 
Today's episode is brought to you by Imagine Strength, your one-stop solution for safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. When it comes to high-intensity training, it's about the right workout machines intelligently designed for your studio. That's the specialty of Imagine Strength. Inspired by the legendary Arthur Jones, they've pioneered efficient and affordable fitness equipment perfectly crafted for your HIT business. With a team that lives and breathes HIT, Imagine Strength combines passion, innovation, and careful design into every piece of equipment, creating the perfect environment for an intense yet rewarding workout. So why choose Imagine Strength? Number one, they create innovative, tailor-made equipment for HIT studios. Number two, they provide cost-efficient designs, making HIT more accessible. And number three, they're committed to continuous innovation and refinement so your studio never falls behind. Elevate your HIT business with a team at Imagine Strength. Visit imaginestrength.com to discuss your needs and select the gear that'll take your business to new heights. Be a part of the HIT revolution with Imagine Strength and see how their equipment can transform your workout experience. In all seriousness, this is where HIT training is great for us cyclists because it's not geared around, you know, a volume of training that's going to add, that's going to optimize muscle mass. I mean, it can add muscle mass, there's no question, but it's certainly not going to, it, it's not, I mean, you saw the, the paper I did with Brad and, and co recently about optimizing muscle mass to certainly higher volumes. And then there might be some truth in, in that. Well, it is, it's not geared around high volume training to optimize muscle mass. It's geared around strength and health benefits and the performance benefits that we've talked about. So I think it's, I think it's good sell for cyclists. Yeah. That's fascinating actually. And. And that's quite a, a neat segue into programming considerations. Now, I know obviously the answer is it depends because you have to do that really in-depth needs analysis to understand the programming. But let's just make up an avatar. Maybe let's just use you, right? Because you know yourself and you already know all your needs. And maybe you can create a made make up, um, a made up uh, race schedule for us, right? And we can actually get a template because I just want, although I think obviously members need to listen to this and then apply the the approach to then develop the program and all of that i think it's just helpful to have a template so what does that look like yeah go ahead you got some thoughts you want to share okay. yeah so yeah, yeah um i mean really used for me to talk through so a typical year there was a, an event called ride london that i used to do so ride london is a closed road 100 mile um sportive slash race that started in uh, Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth Park, went down through Surrey, cut mm-hmm. Leith Hill, Box Hill, some of the decent climbs in that part of the world, um, and back up and finished in front of the in front of Buckingham Palace and the Mall in London. It's 100 miles. And that was always the end of August. It was typically the weekend, the last weekend in August. So my year, my cycling year, would typically through January, February, Cyclists often do what they call junk miles through the winter. They just get on a bike and they go out and they try and cover some miles and they get back and it's and that's it. And they don't really have a goal in mind. They're just trying to keep some degree of fitness, keep a base level of fitness. That never made any sense to me. And I hate the term junk miles because it implies that it's useless. And and the big problem with that for me is that they can go out and do maybe a three hour ride, but have a cafe stop somewhere in between where they can serve you know, 800 calories of cake or biscuits or brownies, like, you know, <laughs> and a latte and two cappuccinos or whatever, and, you know, and, and seriously consume a huge amount of food and, or a huge amount of calories. And in the entire ride, potentially only burn 1500, 2000 kilocalories total. So it was never purposeful. It was never going to improve their fitness. It was simply about being on the bike for them. And, and there's huge respect for anybody who goes on the bike in winter. It's not much fun. For me, my cycling in the winter turned indoor and it became very purposeful interval sessions or training sessions where I would look at a power base and I would say, today I want to do 30 minutes averaging 250 watts. Today I want to do an hour averaging 270 watts. Today I want to do an hour intervals between 300 and 250 watts, whatever it might be. And it became very structured, very purposeful to main, to, to maintain or improve my kind of power metrics or whatever I'm looking at. That might be the other thing that we look at in a, in a consultation, just taking a step back and saying, how do you measure performance? Is there a specific race that you do? 
Is there a specific event that you do? Because no two triathlons are the same. Weather conditions differ, road conditions differ, a run. If you're playing as part of a team against another team, conditions change. So what are the metrics of performance? It might be that they have vertical jump. It might be they, they do a 5K run, that they do the same run regularly and they know how they feel on it. It might be that they look at their heart rate and they know their heart rate recovery or their average heart rate over performance. Or, that, or, or, or with cyclists, it might be something called an FTP, which is functional threshold power, which is the uh, average power, average peak power that you can sustain over 20 minutes. So my typical year through, through January to March would probably look something like that. Around March, my, myself and my family um, would typically get away to somewhere through which time strength training was wherever I wanted it to be. So it was typically full body workouts, um, you know, uh, uh, maybe an Apollo a split if I wanted to go that way, but typically full body workouts with, with all the lower body work and, and all the trimmings as well. So whatever I wanted to add in, um, or include, I, and potentially more of a focus on the strength training. If I get on the bike and I feel fatigued from the, from the resistance workout, that's fine because I'm indoors anyway. So, you know, whilst I'm trying to sustain 250 watts, if I only sustain 245 because my legs are trashed from a workout the day before, that's okay. For me, that was fine. In March, we would typically go away for a week to somewhere like Tenerife, where we would do where there's a big volcano called Tidy. We would do a lot of climbs with the volcano there. They're normally um, an hour to an hour and a half, depending on the route. And you can gain about 1,000 to 1,300 meters of elevation uh, in that time. Um, probably sustained somewhere between 240 and 300 watts. And an average heart rate of somewhere around 150, 160 for me through, for, for an hour, an hour, an hour and a half. Um, I do that probably most days. In a week or nine days, I'd probably get that in six, seven days and maybe have some other rides in there as well. Um, coming back off that, I would then get back outdoors on the bike, which meant that my resistance training had to be amended based on who I was riding with. If I'm riding on my own, if I've got a ride planned on my own, it doesn't matter if the resistance training trashes the ride. If it's riding with other people, I'm probably going to rest the day before. So it, it then had to start to, it then became a factor. And in the run from March to, to August, I then looked up kind of what events I was doing, whether there were any big rides, whether there were any big sportives, 100 milers, um, big events that I wanted to do that I then added in any tapering days beforehand or how big the result from that was. So typically for me, none of the other results mattered. If I was turning up to a, another hundred mile ride, I would probably take a day or so off beforehand, but I wouldn't worry about doing normal workouts the week before and, and so forth, because I wasn't necessarily looking to get best time I could. It was part of training to spend that long on a bike and, and so forth. Um, and kind of gauge my fitness and my fueling and, and so forth. Um, as I got towards August, probably July, early August, I would take another week in the Alps and I would do, um, a week out there where I do Alp Duas probably two or three times, which is again, a thousand meters of climbing in about an hour. That's about 12 K 13 K climb, um, about an average of about 8%, 9%. Um, and probably a few of the other climbs around that area and, and, and have a focus purely on cycling. So each of those weeks would be purely cycling. There's no strength training in them at all. And, and they, they were nice to take that break away from strength training and kind of use that as a measure of where I'm at on the bike. Everything in between, my upper body strength training was consistently uh, two days a week, occasionally three days a week, depending on how big the workout was. So it might be that it was a Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, Monday, Wednesday, Sunday, or, you know, somewhere around that. And my lower body training probably dropped to once or twice a week, um, geared around when I was doing bigger rides and when I was riding with other people. So, um, if I was doing, let's say a 50 mile, which is typically about a two and a half hour ride, 
then I would do that normally with other people. And I would probably have a, a day's complete rest beforehand, or certainly um, a day's rest of the lower body for two days beforehand. So I didn't have any soreness going into it or any, uh, I, I was, I felt fresh to get on the bike and go. And I wasn't the limiting factor on that ride. Just talking about so, reco recovery briefly. Sorry, James. Uh, Cause I'm, I'm just thinking, I just want to understand like, what is, I know every individual recovers differently, right? But, but how do we, is, do we base recovery intervals? Obviously we, we understand the client's race schedule, their training schedule, that kind of thing. Um, and, and are we then looking at performance to judge, uh, is someone recovered and then we can change recovery windows or number of days of recovery as we learn more about the athlete as well? Because for, for me, sorry, I don't know if I'm, I know the internet's a little bit flaky. Um, I'm not, I, I'm thinking with some people one day might not be enough, right? Like one day off before a race. Yeah. So how do we figure that out? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the key thing is to look at that typical training routine and to review it with, with a degree of frequency. So, so it might be that it's reviewed every month or every four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, whatever it might be. It might be that it's, it's tweaked every, uh, every so often, especially in the run up to an event where it might be tapered, where the volume that they might do might decrease, where the frequency that they might do might decrease or change to give them, you know, a sufficient rest. Um, believe it or not, most people overtrain in the endurance sport and undertrain in the strength element. And, and actually they can probably sustain a lot more on the bikes than they realize with, with the, with additional strength workouts and still see improvements. Um, it might be that what, what hit practitioners really need to do is work with the athlete to reduce the number of hours they spend on a bike that's not productive. You know, I said about junk miles, I think, you know, if we've got a cyclist in the winter doing junk miles every day, we'd do a lot to get them to lose a day or two of that in favor of strength training or even added strength training on a couple of days and have them shorten that ride on those days. Um, as you get towards race season or towards competition season or a competition event, I think certainly you need to look at how well they feel, how they feel recovered. Um, you might, the great thing about endurance athletes is they love the metrics. Uh, ironically, Luke Carlson is one of the few people who, do, who doesn't seem to use Strava or his resting heart rate or heart rate variability or any of the metrics like that. And I, I know that I, every, every morning I wake up and I look at the amount of sleep I got and I look at what my heart rate drops through every night. And, and most nights when I had a good night's sleep, I'm somewhere between 38 and 43 beats per minute. And if I wake up and it's in the fifties. Then it's because I was up during the night a lot, maybe with my son, or it's because I had a few beers before I went to bed or whatever it might be that's disrupting my sleep. Or I'm in a state of maybe overtraining where I need to bring things back in a little bit. Um, so I think that most endurance athletes will have a Garmin, will track their training, will track their recovery and have a good idea of kind of where they're going with that. Um, so they might be the people to speak to about how they're going. Um, I think we've got to remember as well, it's not about getting them in the gym and getting them to improve their strength week in, week out. You know, hip practitioners love to see progress. Did you do more reps or, and or more loads than last time and or a longer time under load than last time? Well, yeah, that's great, but that doesn't happen with everybody. And it certainly doesn't happen with endurance athletes who are pitching a lot of their energy in the direction. So maybe the benefit is, are they getting faster on the bike? Yes. Are they doing the same as they did last week in the gym? Because their goal is not to get stronger in the gym. Their goal is to get faster on the bike. Or that's faster. so key. So you, so that's the thing, like, obviously um, in most cases, you're probably still trying to get that athlete to train hard. Cause I had a quote here from, um, Patrick Diver, who's a, a, a strength training studio owner in Florida is quite well known, obviously. And um, he's actually also a, or was a cycling athlete. And he said that when it comes to building strength and metabolic fitness, I would say the most important thing is to motivate athletes to train hard. It may seem obvious, but many athletes don't train that hard, which is interesting. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, to your point, it's like, you know, 
train them to muscular failure, but don't obsess about their progression. And obviously, you want to pay attention to it to see if it's a good barometer of performance and recovery, right? But yeah. instead, say, hey, uh, just check in on the race performance. When was you, what was your last time when you did a, a trial race run or whatever? You, yeah, I'm ignorant. I just say, say anything. Or when you did your last race, like, well, you know, check in on those metrics because that's how you're being measured. If that is the thing that they're they're training with you for, you know, unless they're yeah. specifically said, yeah. no, I want to like maybe they're like you, right? Maybe they they do care about the race performance, but they also want to improve strength and muscle mass, right? Um, so maybe you have to obviously tailor this feedback to the client. Yeah, I, I, and I think that Patrick's absolutely right. And, and I think that um, the, the harder we train, the more we get accustomed to putting ourselves in that place where we're in a degree of physical discomfort. And um, in an endurance sport, you'd think most endurance athletes would be really good at that. By my experience, most endurance athletes get anywhere close to a dark place where they're working hard and then they back up and back up and back off. And they don't quite realize how far or how hard they can push their body. And what they really need to do is think, am I going to, am I prepared to work that hard to get what I want? Um, now in strength training, when you've got somebody, somebody pushing you, that's great. In the endurance world, if you've got a coach and somebody pushing you, you probably get there a lot sooner and a lot quicker. But if you're out there as a cyclist without that coaching, without that, that person pushing you, it's very easy to feel that discomfort, that pain, see that heart rate get up, feel those lungs burn and back off. Um, there's a, there's a famous South African, um, exercise physiology but in his, in his office, he's got a picture of the second place marathon runner in, uh, in something like the 1984 or 1988 Olympics. And he's got it quite deliberately as, as the second place marathon runner. And when people walk in the room and they still say, you know, who, who's that? And he's a silver medalist, you know, finished second in such a, such a marathon. They say, oh, why the silver, why the silver medalist? Why the second place runner? And his response is, well, you, you see by looking at him, he's not dead. And that means he could have run faster. And the reality is that we have this kind of mental stop somewhere in our body that says, yeah, I, I think now's the time to shut it down. I think now's the time to stop working so hard. You know, when we get to, if, if, if we run a marathon, at some point in that marathon, our pace decreases to a sustainable pace. And the reality is it probably couldn't have been higher. Now, ironically, I'm actually blessed with the opposite mentality. I think make hay while the sun shines, go as hard as you can and let that pace drop and drop and drop because you physically can't sustain anymore. I cross the line crying and whimpering and bleeding and, you know, all of the worst things that you can imagine because maybe that's just the sadistic part of me that's come from here to whatever it might be. But, but most people will cross the finish line and, and they'll, they'll be, they'll kind of be fine. Actually, you kind of go, you know, you've kind of, ten, you've kind of gone 10 minutes quicker on that or. You know, and when you've got the right person next to you, you, you can do it. And then you go, oh yeah, my body can actually do that. So, so I definitely think there's a lot in here to push people outside their comfort zone. Well, that's an awesome side benefit, isn't it? That you know, can help them tolerate more discomfort and ultimately improve their performance in that sense. That's fascinating. And just, we got nine minutes left, James, and I'd just love to finish on, I guess, a template workout. Well, let's say, let's put you you're coming up to a race and you're, I just want to get into the, your workout template in detail, you know, and, um, and, you know, in terms of like, what are the, what do you think were the most important exercises for you in that template? Like, you know, what, what do we need to be thinking about in terms of changing the programming for a cyclist? Like, should we not do any bicep curls, for instance, should we do more hamstring and, 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 uh, calf work, right? These sorts of things. So. Yeah, so I think through through the bulk part of the year where you're not worried about the event, you you would you would start you would do a typical hit workout would probably work fine. You start with the major muscle groups, multi joint, upper and lower body. I think you would definitely add in some kind of single joint for the hamstrings, um, maybe even a couple of single joint for the hamstring. So you might do a seated leg curl and maybe a Romanian deadlift or something along those lines. You might even look at single single leg movements. So negative accentuates is great. Lift the weight with two lower, it was one. 
um, or even or even unilateral movements. So maybe a split squat or a single leg Romanian deadlift can be great. And um, because you you add that, you kind of challenge that limb, and you start to see if there's a limiting balance left to right. And um, I don't necessarily think that that's a, a key part of training regular regularly, but I think that it can be a good way to look at other imbalances happening here left to right. Um, as we get toward closer towards events, certainly as I get closer towards events, my training becomes less um, whole body. So I might start to drop low body out. So let's say I'm doing a big ride. Let's say my big ride is on a Sunday, which it was always on a Sunday. So the weekend before, I would probably still do uh, a, a good a good ride. Say the Sunday before, I would do a good ride, which meant the Saturday before, I would probably lift upper body only so I could get in one last big ride and feel fresh on that ride. The Monday now, I might train lower body. And, the mon- and that gives me now six full days recovery for my lower body. And I might you know, go all now. I might do squats and leg presses and lunges and and knee extensions and leg curls and adductors and abductors and whatever else it can be. Um, I'd probably rest Tuesday. Wednesday, I might try and get in another ride. Uh, if I could, maybe an hour, a couple of hours, uh, maybe an interval session if that's what I had available. And then Thursday, I'd probably put in um, a, another upper body workout. Um, that gives me the Friday and the Saturday to be completely rested, um, completely rested apart from daily activity. The Thursday would probably consist of big movements like uh, an overhead press. Um, So a vertical press, a vertical pull, uh, a horizontal press, a horizontal pull, and then maybe single joint bicep, single joint tricep. And that would probably be about it. And in that, there's also not so much happening in the trunk, arguably, except maybe if you did pull ups rather than a pull down. a lot of my training includes body weight movements. So I might do an inclined chest press into push-ups, And I like that because apart from the fact that the push-ups become, you know, incredibly challenging up for an inclined press, um, there's a trunk activation as well. So there's, you know, we're, we're bracing in the core. There's a, a um, trunk stability, um, happening, um, I think, I think we'd also maybe drop things like Roman chair or lumbar extension. We might drop any lateral flexion or rotation just to rest the muscles of the trunk as well. Uh, and that way we kind of keep everything from probably about the rib cage down, completely rested for the last few days in the run-in. And, and the reason that I do two full days is for, for a sort of a systemic recovery as well. Um, I think on that third, on that say Thursday workout, it would be easy to go too far with the workout and have, you know, the recovery be more than 24, 48 hours. You know, if you reach the Saturday and your body's still systemically recovering from that workout on the Sunday, you're probably not in, in the prime, you know, to go out and compete. Yeah. James, that's awesome. Thank you for that. I was wondering, do you have, are you able to provide like, um, like what your workout templates would look like, maybe like two or three where it's just, just in bullets, you know, each exercise kind of like you did for the the podcast we did with Luke on your, um, current workouts, but there was a few months ago. I was wondering if that's something you, you could just knock up and we could put that into the the membership post for this. Yeah, I can, I can find something by the email across to you. Definitely. No Thank you. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm thinking like you could have like, you'd have like the standard workout, like what, what it would look like to, you know, mid season, let's call it where you're, you know, you're, you're training all of the, the muscle groups that are important for your particular specialty, right? Your focus and then tapering it off as you get towards the race. That would be so interesting to see the contrast between the two or three or however many you want to provide. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely, definitely dig something out. I keep, I keep a record of all my workouts. So, just super simple, just a couple, of just bulleted exercises. Like, yeah, don't, yep. don't need to spend loads of time. Um, just conscious of time. Got to wrap this one up because got stuff to do, and I know you've got stuff to do too. Uh, what's the best way for for members to to get in touch if they've got any questions? If you're okay yeah. with that. So, oh, so the best way is probably to email me. So James Fisher at solent.hu.uk, that's S-O-L-E-N-T dot H-U dot U-K. Um, most people probably also use Facebook or, or Twitch or whatever. I, 
I'm pretty crap with Twitter, if I'm honest, but I'm always available on Facebook. So if you're not friends with me, then friend me and PM me or whatever. And, um, yeah, track me down or, or post messages in the forum on the, um, on the membership. Yeah. And there'll, there'll obviously be a thread for this. So members can do that. And um, James, thanks so much for taking the time. This has been so valuable and, uh, just for our own process and I'm sure for members right. as well. Right. Um, and for, for everyone uh, tuning in, this will be recorded and transcribed for future reference. Um, so we'll have a, a PDF of a transcription as well. Thank you for being a member. And James, on that, I will let you go. And I'm sure it won't be long till we do our next podcast together, hopefully. But thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Have a great Christmas. See you later. You too. Merry Christmas. Hey, it's Lawrence again here. And I hope you enjoyed that episode. I certainly enjoyed recording it. And um, if you would like to contact James, please uh, email James to james.fisher at solent.ac.uk. And remember to grab your free PDF guide on how to turn your hip business into a robust referral machine. You can download that over highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref. This is both a playbook, um, which I designed with the help of the founder and CEO of Discover Strength, Luke Carlson, on exactly how you build a business that generates referrals on autopilot. And we go through all the steps. We also provide a full length video training with Luke to go through this as well. You'll also get access to tons of free resources, including hit business guides, checklists, and much, much more. Go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref to access your free hit business treasure trove of resources. Again, it's highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref. That's R-E-F short for referrals. And to get the show notes for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com. Search for episode 424. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. This episode is brought to you by Imagine Strength, your go-to for safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. Growing a successful high-intensity training business requires workout equipment that's not only high quality, but also intelligently designed to fit the unique needs of your studio. And that's where Imagine Strength comes in. Drawing on the wisdom of the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength has crafted a groundbreaking line of fitness equipment that's as affordable as it is efficient, giving your studio the upgrade it needs without breaking the bank. The team at Imagine Strength breathes hit. Their passion for high-intensity training shines through in their designs, which they've consistently refined and innovated for optimum effectiveness and user experience. From my personal experience at REC, I can attest to the careful consideration and craftsmanship that goes into every single piece. My Imagine Strength workout was absolutely brutal, in a good way, of course. Now, what makes Imagine Strength truly stand out? They have innovative equipment tailored for the unique needs of hit studios, affordable and efficient designs, lowering the barriers to entry for a hit business, continuous innovation and refinement, ensuring your studio stays ahead of the curve. Founder Jeff Turner and his team are dedicated to moving the hit industry forward and making strength training accessible to more people than ever before. Here's how you get started. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, discuss your specific needs with the team. And number three, select the equipment that will propel your business to the next level. Head to imaginestrength.com today and give your hit business the Imagine Strength edge. Be part of the hit revolution and see firsthand how their unique equipment can transform your studio's workout experience. Elevate your hit business with Imagine Strength. <laughs>